on the town was a musical that Comden and Green wrote that's just a great musical and very popular. They do it all the time. And it was the first time anyone saw the amalgam of Lenny's ballet music, Jerry's dance, in a very light, frivolous musical that Comden and Green wrote. It worked really well. I loved it. I actually saw it when I was in college. I saw it nine times because I thought I'm looking at something new that, that draws me elements of which draw me to the musical theater when I've not been drawn there before. And the phone rang in Boston, and I was in the, uh, the hotel, and Steve Sondheim called, and I said, I told him my problems. It never occurred to me asking him how he, what his were. But ours were, ours were minimal compared, because we were struggling to get, get the show finished to come to Broadway, where it did ultimately a couple of weeks later. But then when I was finished, he said, we've lost our producer, we have no show, uh, being, wonderful, uh, being West Side Story. Lenny had told everyone no one was to ever hear this score. And I knew every note of the score because Steve was my friend and he'd play it all the time. So I knew it all, but I had to pretend that I'd never heard any of it. So we went to Lenny's apartment and they were all there on that Sunday and, and Lenny, was nervous. He'd never heard anybody pound so loudly on the piano, just in an effort to please. And uh, uh, Steve sang some of the lyrics with Lenny. And uh, it was just as thrilling as anything can be. And, and uh, I started to sing along inadvertently. And, and Lenny stopped. And a nervous pause, and then he said, that's what I've always been looking for, is a musical producer. And we said, we will do this show, but we're, you cannot call us and talk to us about any of your problems. We have to get this other show fixed and into New York and open on Broadway, and we'll go to work the next day. We also parenthetically said, you guys are being all paid too much by Cheryl Crawford. It's not... It's not it's not that you don't deserve more. It's just not good from an investor's point of view. And we're going to renegotiate all your contracts. Long pause. We did. Because we decided that we knew how to pay shows off quicker than anybody else, which is how we got a quick reputation in the business. And we wanted to continue. Um, anyway, we came in with New Girl. Reviews very mixed. Show ran. Paid back. But I think six weeks later then it was meant to go into rehearsal. We actually went into rehearsal with West Side Story, having cast it, having completed the designs, having found the theaters, the bookings. We came to Washington, to the National, uh, and it was spectacular from, from the get-go in front of audiences. It was just thrilling. You knew, you knew right away. The, the, uh, my memory is that the only thing that ever got fiddled around with forever was Somewhere, which was a, a song top of the second act uh, where Riri Grist, the opera singer, stood in, uh, sat in the pit and sang. She wasn't seen by the audience, and there was a whole big ballet between the Jets and the Sharks, and, and that just got fiddled with and fiddled with and fiddled with until it finally we had to open. But um, uh, it was quite thrilling. They'd never seen anything quite like it. They were just thrilled, just excited. It's very, it just got right. It, the blood boils. And, and it's exciting. And, and the uh, Romeo and Juliet story is pretty, pretty swell. Um, so uh, it, it was very... Uh, Arthur Lawrence created a language for it, which some people are fond of saying, what is all that cracko jacko stuff, womb-to-tomb stuff? You had to create a different language, uh, which is probably why uh, sometimes, you, you know, you, you talk to Sondheim and you heard him criticize some of his lyrics. The, the fact that it's all heightened and people are not real and they're not really saying uh, what they would have said in the words they would have used, I think that would have been an impossible task and, and, and in a, inappropriate. They stayed with me, those 175 investors, for the, most of my producing career when I was producing and directing my own shows, which is something Abbott had done. I directed and produced the shows. And the point is, uh, as, as, as in Cabaret, the point is uh, that uh, 
they didn't need us on Broadway. They had Rodgers and Hammerstein doing just fine and Fuhrer and Martin doing just fine and Leland Hayward and the Theater Guild need us. So when we decided to do the first show, we had to analyze what can we do that will impress people immediately that there are new boys in town and that we found a different way to invent the wheel. And we figured that the way to do that was to do a show as elegantly as it required, but cheaper in terms of cost than anybody was doing them and get the money back to the investors as soon as possible. I think it's very important uh, in the commercial theater to return the investment. I know there are fewer and fewer people who agree with me because the investor now is, is so wealthy in his own right that he's the producer. So you look at a, a Broadway show today and you'll see a whole lot of names over the, excuse me, over the, over the title. And really who they are is the people who put up the money to put the show on. And they can take a loss if it doesn't, if it doesn't happen. And it's a shot at a Tony Award and all that sort of thing. And they enjoy the theater. But it isn't the safeguard that I think, it, it, it doesn't restrain you the way it did us to have to make it a good investment. It also, and see if I can make sense out of this, after a, a bunch of successes at the box office, it gave us the right to have failures that did something we divined was important for the musical theater form. In other words, you could say to the investor, and I would do it in a letter, I'm not certain you'll ever see this money again, but you've been doing just fine, uh, and then we, we do follies or Pacific overtures or, do you know, you'd, you'd do a show that you had to do for artistic reasons that, in fact, ultimately, in case of both those shows, are somewhat historical, but they never returned a plug nickel to anybody, but the investors didn't care because they took a pride in being part of the process. There's one definitive moment it's the, uh, in the road. It's the moment when you, as, as a producer or even a director, decide that you're giving the audience what it wants rather than taking the audience on a journey you want it to take. West Side Story is a perfect example of taking the audience somewhere. When it first opened, 100 people walked out on that show every night for a year. Lots of people didn't get it. It didn't win the Tony Awards or any of that stuff. But it here it is, and it did pay off, and, uh, and it made a, a film that, that they be, uh, benef uh, benefited from. The point is, I still believe you have to, to, to take your audience somewhere. And, and don't underestimate how damn smart they are and how willing to be stimulated. But the situation is parlous at the moment. My partner had died by then, and I was alone and, and, and fearful. I wasn't sure. You know, we'd had three partners, then two, and then me. And, and he, he, he died of a heart attack on the golf course. And there, you know. And, uh, and uh, so I... Uh, I was I I, I, I I had already done a couple a couple of shows that succeeded after he died, so I had some credibility and my office was on its feet again. But uh, Fiddler on the Roof, they asked me to direct uh, Bach and Harnick, and I said, though I'm Jewish, that's not my family background, so I don't know it. I'm I, mine is German. I don't understand shtetls. Sheldon Harnick gave me a book about shtetls. And I thought, I'd, I, I, this is, I'd be fraudulent. I don't feel this. So um, I said, get Jerry Robbins. And he wasn't available. And, and, and I said, instead, I'll do your other musical, which was She Loves Me, which was a great start for me in terms of people knowing I knew what I was doing and a musical I love. But then... They went back to Jerry, and Jerry said, 
get Hal Prince to produce it. So, and 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 so I went. I, I said yes, and and that seemed the perfect combination. And indeed, for Jerry, it was a hymn to his father. He did it for his father, and his initial uh, dance teacher played the old rabbi in the original production of Fiddler on the Roof. Jerry insisted and insisted and insisted on that opening number being larger and 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 engulfing a huge audience that wasn't Jewish that didn't know about shtetls and so on and over and over again they they talk about it and then finally one day somebody used the word tradition and he said that's it right about tradition that everybody has so the show has been as great a success in Tokyo as it was on Broadway and anywhere there's tradition well where isn't there tradition? Actually, unfortunately, there's less tradition today, and that's a terrible loss culturally to all of us than there used to be. But that time, tradition was just international. Every country held on to that tradition, and the show succeeded because of it. I really was interested in theater from the get-go, and that's very lucky. I mean, uh, they, I, I, my, I went to theater when I was eight years old. Every Saturday afternoon, we went to theater. That was a routine. And uh, they really weren't particularly aggressively highbrow eggheads, but, but I, they took me to some very odd stuff. The first show I ever saw was Orson Welles in the Mercury Theater production of Julius Caesar. And that's an eight-year-old. That's pretty strange stuff, and, and I've never forgotten it. You never forget the, the in, initial experiences you have, you know. But then I saw all the great actors, and I saw plays, very few musicals. I caught up with a few musicals, but they always struck me as kind of silly, which is why I suppose so few of the musicals I've done have been appropriately silly. I caught on to plays as, as a reading matter. I don't do that much anymore, but I think it must have been a hell of a good idea because I knew all those plays, all the history of plays from the uh, even pre-turn of the 20th century, and I read them, read them all, and uh, and loved reading them to the exclusion sometimes of uh, of great books. But uh, you know, and then I got to know very early on, very lucky. I got to know a lot of those playwrights, be in the same room with. Robert Sherwood, and, and, and uh, uh, oh, his like, there were, there were a lot of great playwrights around. Sidney Kingsley I knew very well, and Elmer Rice I met, and a whole lot of people like that. The Rogers family, Mary and Linda and, and uh, Dick and Dorothy, and they were very generous uh, uh, about young people being around. So you'd spend your Christmas Eve at their house, a, l a lot of young people, Steve included, Steve Sondheim included, and uh, and then I got a job very early, very early. I got a job with George Abbott, who was one of the preeminent director, producers, playwrights. He wrote melodramas. He wrote musicals. He directed the first Rodgers and Hart musical, Jumbo. He did all that stuff, and he had a hugely successful career that went for 75 years. And, uh, and he took me on as a 20-year-old. I had written him, and uh, coming out of college, I was terrified of how, how do you find a job? So I wrote him a letter to his office, and I said, um, I don't know what what I could ever do that would be worth any money at this point. I've had so little experience. Uh, so if you would take me on and make me useful, let me be useful, if you can tell that you're not paying me, that was the suggestion, by the nature of what I do, then please fire me right away. And the letter was so curious that uh, I went there to work and stayed there. And, and then we shared an office, and then I became a, a producer, and then I became, and he, he, he was the director of the shows I produced with my partner, and then I became a director, and we shared offices, and then, and uh, he died at 107, oh, 12, 13 years ago, I'm not certain, but I kept his name on the door, 
uh, until I moved offices. When I moved office, the whole thing seemed a little macabre. My wife said, "You know, I think you're really overdoing it. You, you, you know, you're you're in your 70s. You can you can stop that now. Childhood is painful. Not everyone's, but I don't know too many people doing that that, that are my colleagues who didn't have some painful childhood, and not not necessarily imposed on you by your parents. Certainly not deliberately. It's 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 probably just something." born in you, but I was very solitary, and I escaped into fantasies. And I, this is, by the way, very common. Uh, I read uh, uh, Julie Harris at one point said she used to play with uh, a stage and so on, and lots of playwrights have done that. And I did. I had a stage, and I'd, and I'd perform things just for me on it. Uh, 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 I'd listen to the opera on Sundays, and Milton Cross would tell the opera story, and then, then the opera would start. See, the great golden curtain at the Met, the old Met on 37th Street has gone up. Ladies and gentlemen, rises on, and then I would have set the stage and follow the... But I didn't speak the language they were singing in, so, of course, sometimes I was way behind them and the great golden curtain would fall, and sometimes I would be finished with Act One and they would still be singing. You know? I started out being an office boy. I, uh, the, we, the water was... Uh, in bottles, very heavy, and you came in the morning and turned them over into the machine and uh, and uh, uh, the water cooler. You opened the windows, there was no air conditioning. This is all in 1948. And uh, uh, then I did the mail, and then if there were odd deliveries, and then I hung around. And then uh, he signed a contract. He wanted to try out television. So he signed a contract he opened a little firm. He was married then to that, his second wife. And he opened a firm with some people, and, and uh, they, they did some shows, game shows and stuff. And I sort of uh, took the people who were in the game show to, to the commissary. Monday morning, I heard a shout from his office, and he said, Will you come in here? I just got the script from California. Damn, I have to write a whole half-hour television show. And I said... I wrote one over the weekend in case you'd like to see it. And he said, give it to me. And I gave it to him, and he said, it's fine. Let's do it just your way. And why don't you direct it? And I said, what are you saying? He said, you can direct. I've been watching you. Go go direct it. So, And I said, are you going to... The actors, no one's going to listen to a 20-year-old. Uh, and I, He said, uh, I was probably 21 by then. He said, no, go ahead. Directed, I'll come on Thursday for the and, and, and make some comments. So the actors did look at me strangely. Uh, it bore his name, the script, so we didn't have to go over that. And uh, I directed the show, and he came in and made a nip or a tuck there or something, not much, and the show went on the air. But I, I was a very abrasive kid. I mean, I, 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 it wasn't... It, it, the energy level was just too high. I, I was trying hard to be, to be tactful, and, and, but I, I had a lot of ambition. The amount of, of kinetic energy I gave off, which was clearly spurred by too much ambition, uh, drove them all a little bit nuts, and, and uh, they went to Abbott and said, you know, he's okay and, and he knows what he's doing, but it's, it's very abrasive. And he said, so please come back. And he said, no, it's, it's him or no show. And he stood up for me. And the show went off the air. I went backstage, and uh, I, my, my boss was his longtime stage manager, Bobby Griffith. And he decided to show me the ropes. And he did. And, uh, and then he let me run the show. And that was when it was pretty evident to me, not anyone else, I was one step ahead of the sheriff, that I was not made to be a stage manager because uh, I did two more shows, but I always called the cues the way I would have liked them to be. I changed the tempo of the scene changes just slightly because I felt like it would be better if these overlapped. It would be better if this moved more. And, 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 and so 
uh, early on, I would catch the stagehands still moving the scenery. They had to fall behind a couch and hang there for the balance of the scene. But that, that's the way it happened. The war was just over. So everything was just demolished in Germany, and yet there were op opera houses still functioning, ballet companies still working. There was theater, and, uh, and I was outside of Stuttgart, and I hung out in a little bar in Stuttgart called Maxim's, which was in a bombed-out church, and there was a little guy, an MC, with lots of makeup and eyeshadow and stuff, and there were three huge vault. Kiri ladies in diaphanous gowns glumping around and you'd have a couple of drinks and watch him try to get a short a small and uh, audience uh, in, into it enthusiastic and, and and he was very obsequious and hard-working sweat a lot and years later 1966 when we were we hadn't quite figured out how to do cabaret. We'd done a version, and I, I, I thought it's not exciting enough. I drew on that guy and brought a friend in, Joel Gray, and introduced him to Kander and Ebb, and they wrote for him, and, uh, and that was the MC. When I came back from the Army, I reminded myself of the problems that I had escaped by being drafted. And so at the top of my calendar, on my desk, I wrote two words, and I wrote them for the next five years. Watch it. Just watch it with an exclamation point. And so when I'd come in to work in the morning, I'd see those two words that were saying, calm down. And uh, I watched it. There was a review in the New York Times of a book called Seven and a Half Cents, and he was working on something else at the time and could not, he read the review and said, read the review and if you like it, read the book and if you like it, get the book. So I read the review and I rushed and got the book, read it ever so quickly, found the agent, called the agent, went to see the agent, who was a fellow named Harold Matson, a very, very important and, and uh, highly esteemed fellow. And he, had offers from other people because of that review. One of them from Leland Hayward, who was a big time producer who had done South Pacific. But he bet on the two kids, or what George always called us the kids. There were a lot of years separating us, but he called us that. And we, uh, Roz Russell heard about it and said, my husband, who was a movie guy, nice man named Freddie Brisson, uh, will you take a, a partner? And we said, sure, raise the money. Where are we going to get the money? In those days, 250,000 bucks. Today, 12 million. And uh, so we did do that. And he did bring in, in, in some money. And w we did the rest by doing backers auditions. So there, and, and it turned into the biggest hit of the season instantly, which was a wonderful thing. When you work with Jerome Robbins, it's a Jerome Robbins musical. And then when you work for yourself, you take so much that you observe from other successful directors, but then there's one moment where you have to say, it isn't, this isn't gonna, this career isn't gonna happen the way I want it to happen unless I'm, I express myself. I don't wanna get lost. I've always heard that theory about get lost in the material. That's the, that's the dear, uh, dearly to be desired, but I don't believe it for one minute. I think you want, you want to uh, be visible uh, uh, on that stage, and I, and uh, that happened. It happened really. I did a wonderful show before Cabaret called "She Loves Me," but it looked so smooth and 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 tasteful and and so on. Cabaret did something else. So wait a minute, this is different. This is we have never seen this before. We were in rehearsal, I think, at the, what's now the Richard Rogers, the Forty Sixth Street Theater, and I was standing on the street, and uh, was getting some air, and Leland Hayward walked by, and uh, I had been in his office working at one point. Abbott had sent me over to work for him. And uh, uh, he said, what are you doing? And I said, we're doing West Side Story. And he, and he put an arm on my shoulder and he said, good, it's time you had a flop. 
and walked on down the street smiling, and it was meant in a jocular fashion, but it spoke for the industry and what everybody thought. Nobody knows. Yeah. George Firth had written a bunch of plays, and Steve said to me, I have a friend named George Firth who's written a bunch of one-act plays for Kim Stanley to star in. Will you read them? They don't seem to be, it doesn't seem to be happening, though she's very interested. So I read seven plays, and I said, well, you know, all I could see reading them, he writes, great, Steve, but all I could see was Kim Stanley running to make costume and wig changes and makeup changes while, while you know, it, it, it just exhausted me. That's all, that's as far as my imagination would take me. But I'll tell you what, it's a musical. And he said, it is. And he called George and we met in my office. And I said, yes, guys, it's a musical. And, and they went and struggled and Steve brilliantly figured out how to write a score for a show that did not move the show along and was not, where the songs were not internal to the scenes preserving George First's unique writing and at the same time amplifying the relationships between scenes, interrupting a scene and, and, and doing a number and so on. So it's a very uniquely contrived and, 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 and uh, brilliant score. And uh, I, I felt comfortable on the, the birthday parties, which were dark. Uh, there were, it was all started with a birthday, ended with a birthday, and, and, and they, they, they reappeared. They're, they're right up my alley. And that's something that got added and, and, uh, to the show. And, and uh, the show bubbles a lot of the time, but there's, there's a dark spine somewhere there. It was a realistic show about a bunch of people who go to a theater and get very drunk and start to fight with props that were on the walls from an old musical. And, uh, and it, all, it, it, it eluded me. And, uh, and, and uh, so what happened was we added ghosts, we added other people, we added uh, alter egos for everybody in the cast and a sense, a terrific sense of mystery. Uh, uh, a la recherche de temps perdu. We wanted to put something gauzy and and melancholy on that stage while telling this story of lost dreams and so on. And uh, uh, the guys did brilliantly. And then, of course, the, the apotheosis, big moment in the thing was when, when all, all the four leading characters and the four leading characters in their youth all converged on stage, circled each other, screamed at each other, and and that erupted in a folly section, a real Zeke folly section. Sweeney was Steve's, very much Steve's show. I didn't get it. I didn't, I didn't, I got it as I went along. Uh, it, it, it's about revenge. And I, I, I'm, I don't think I'm a vengeful guy. I don't think I feel revenge. I recognize its existence. It, the idea of it drains me, you know, uh, it hurts my energy level. So it's about revenge. But um, I got into it, and I got into it because it's very possible I imposed something on it. No one else has ever, who's done it since, has ever done that. I wanted it to have some social significance. And I realized the story takes place during the beginning of the Industrial Age in England, and that all of these people... Uh, Obviously, it turns to cannibalism. Uh, some of them don't even know that they're inadvertently cannibals. But basically, I, I thought they're all sharing one thing. They never s breathe clean air. They never see sunlight. They are, from the day they're born to the day that they die, they're victims. Uh, and so... I said to Eugene Lee, let's do it in a factory and let's put a glass roof on it that makes it claustrophobic and let's tell all of these people that they're in the same spot really that, as the two leading characters in the play, that they're all victims of the industrial age and, and these, this is a time when kids were on, on the assembly line for 14 hours a day doing piecework and so on and that pulled the whole show together for me. And um, oddly enough, 
Uh, it's never been done since, and there certainly are uh, its detractors who think, why did he bother? But I bothered because it made it possible for me to direct it, and I did a good job. Whatever I did with that show, I was convinced that it should be done our town style on a bare stage in a theater with nothing and just some racks of clothes that kids would put on to play scenes. And I called my office together, my staff, and I said, I can't see this show in scenery. I can't see this show in costumes. Uh, these kids are playing life. And, and it goes awry, but, you know, and it's backwards in time. Uh, and they said, you must do what you must do. And I didn't, because I thought, we're going to charge people, whatever it was in those days, $20 a seat. We're going to charge them to, to, to walk into a theater where there's nothing on the stage. And I didn't have the guts. Big mistake. I should have done that. And, I, you know, I regret it. I was living in Spain. We were living in Mallorca. And, and they, uh, 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 Tim actually arrived with a tape of this show about Eva Perón. And he played the tape. And I listened. And the opening number, which had been uh, recorded by the London Symphony Orchestra, they had that kind of money to do that. And uh, with a huge chorus. And... Uh, I said, this opening is 200,000 people in front of the Casa Rosada at Ava's funeral. Wow, it's so exciting, I can't stand it. How the hell do you do that? And I was hooked. So I sat down, listened to all of it, thought it was all marvelous, and wrote a 3,000-word letter saying what I thought should happen and what I would love to do. And I, I got back a letter saying, we're doing a record and your letter's terrific, but it's gonna slow us down and just make us lose confidence. So thanks so much for the time and trouble. And I thought I'll never hear from them again. And they went on, did the record a year and a half later. The record came out, was a huge hit in Europe. And I'm sitting in my office and, and my receptionist says, there are two young men in the front office who wanna see you, they don't have an appointment. And I said, I'll look. I looked. It was them. And they said, we wanted to bring you the record. Now we're ready. Are you ready to do the show? And I said, sure. The next time around, uh, they had broken up. Uh, Tim was working on chess, and Andrew wanted to do uh, Phantom of the Opera. And I was sitting in a restaurant, and he was sitting at the next table with, with, with Sarah Brightman, to whom he was then married. And he said, come over and have coffee. And he said, I'm thinking of Phantom of the Opera as a musical. What do you think? And I said, it's the perfect time for a romantic musical. Perfect. There hasn't been a romantic musical in years. And, and uh, it's what I would like to see. That's often a criterion. I, like, I very often do what I wish I could see when I went to the theater. So it's sort of make your own theater, really. Uh, and, and, uh, and I signed on immediately. And we spent the next two years working on it. I spent a lot of flights back, back and forth to London. The scenery itself took nine flights there and about three for Maria Bjornsson. It, it needed to be, it needed to take an audience where an audience probably could not remember being, but it needed to take them back to being me, seeing Orson Welles at the age of eight in, uh, in Julius Caesar. You needed to go in there and say, I've just lost all my, my problems, all the years of, of patina that, that have developed and crushed and just be in this other world. And uh, in, in so far as it does that, it, 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 has, it seems to have succeeded in its objective. Our rehearsal started at 10 every morning in Lambeth in a school, in a gymnasium. And at one, I would leave, having staged a section of it, sometimes 12.30. And then I would leave my assistant to review what I'd done. And, and then Jillian Lynn would take the rest of the time for choreography. And there is some, some choreography in the show. And then I, I wouldn't come back till the next day. 
So we rehearsed it for four weeks. At the end of four weeks, we had a, a run-through. At the end of the run-through, I said, next Monday we meet in the Her Majesty's Theater. I've been over all the props and the effects, and we're ready for you, and you've done a wonderful job. And one of the cast raised a hand and said, I've been delegated to ask you a question. And I said, go ahead, what is it? What do you do in the afternoon? I'm very organized, and I, I, I don't sit around and do little dots and drawings. When you first start directing, the very first job I ever got, uh, which was stock job directing, um, you, you do little drawings of where you want your actors to go in the scenery. The first play was Angel Street, you know, uh, Gaslight, I think the movie was called. A and then you go in and you start to rehearse the actors, and then the actors, one of them says, I'd love to try going in that direction instead, and th there's, your, there's your whole job gone. You know, somebody who goes somewhere you didn't want them to go, what about all the rest of those people? And, and so uh, preparation is another kind of thing. Preparation is getting everything you need to know of a sensory nature about the characters, where the story's taking place, all those things. I mean what things smell like, taste like, sound like, and so on. And that's, that's an exercise you share with your, art, uh, with your uh, designer as well. Boris Aronson taught me that years ago. He was a, a, the greatest designer that ever lived, I think. And he, uh, he would never design it. I never saw him pick up a pen and, and draw something and say, what do you think of this? Instead, he'd say, uh, what do you think? Of, let's talk about the food. Let's talk about what the restaurants were like. Let's talk about the sound on the street. Let's talk about... And, and so Cabaret for one, was, was a, a black box with selective bits of scenery and one huge surprise. And I, came, I looked at the model for the first time, and there was this waffled, wobbly, funhouse mirror angled at the audience. And they came in and sat down, and they could see this distorted view of themselves. And it's like saying, that's your metaphor, folks. Sort of like the factory in, uh, in Sweeney. I have two left feet. But my direction is characterized, I think, in some of the best work, by movement and by how I will move a block of people you would call an ensemble or a chorus. And they are moving the way dancers would move. They're just, their feet aren't doing anything because I wouldn't know how to tell them that. But I can move them. Jerry moved people diagonally across a stage, from upstage down, directly downstage, turn around, move directly upstage. Strange energies come from all of that. The theater that he entered and that I entered moved laterally. They'd drop a drop and things would move from left to right or right to left. They'd change the scenery upstage, you'd open, there'd be doors. I haven't had a door in a show for as long as I can remember. And, and that whole world of inviting the audience to use its imagination and fill in the blank spaces is the difference between what I do and what people who do realistic films and so on do. Films weren't always realistic. I love old black and white silent films. They were forced perspective and all kinds of strange, wonderful things that I still, that I use in the theater. I'm a huge admirer, as you know, of Wells. It, it, it started with that Mercury Theater production. I do think Citizen Kane is as, as nourishing to me, a theater director, as anything I've ever done. And, and some of the work I've done is an homage. If you take a look at the opera scene in Phantom of the Opera, uh, believe me, I, I wasn't thieving but I was certainly totally paying homage to the opera scene in Citizen Kane. I thought he was just wonderful. I love larger than life. I love people tearing into the theater and saying, it's a black box, the energy. There's an energy there that you can, you can really harness that, you know, uh, is harder, harder on film. Kazan made some great films on the waterfront. It's just a great film. And, and the film version of Streetcar is extraordinary. But 
Streetcar seems like the play to me, seems like a play in a claustrophobic place with people giving performances that they gave on the stage. It's also very important that you make the distinction between success and failure and hit and flop. Uh, Follies was a huge success that lost all its investment money. Uh, hits are shows that do well at the box office and some of them I wouldn't want my name on.